So welcome again, everybody, to the uh, School for Advanced Studies open course on the rise and fall of complex societies. This is the fourth lecture. Uh, we'll continue talking about the structure of complex societies, and then we're going to try to move into from these structural elements to the more um, uh, metaphysical aspects of, it, of how a state's held together as far as the, the how we from the outside can conceive of power within a society, social power. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about territorial limits and, and uh, I don't think we'll make it there today, but we'll try to get to um, the territorial uh, parameters that, that establish complex societies that are part of the defining aspect of complex societies as we move towards imperialism. So uh, again, my name is Jay Silverstein and uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here with you and uh, with the class. And uh, we did have one request from someone who was watching on streaming to, to have access to the readings. I think Shaklo has sent them out from our syllabus. Uh, this is some of the, the key readings that, that are mentioned in the lecture that we talk about or that establish some of the foundations for some of the ideas that we're talking about. Um, so you're certainly welcome to those. And uh, if anyone who is streaming has other questions or wants some some um, additional references or anything, feel free to reach out and uh, you can contact me through Shoplo uh, through the um, chat on the streaming YouTube. All right. So I want to move in a little bit more as we've been talking about different ways that theorists have looked at the, the nature of social political complexity. And uh, I want to hit the work of Elman Service on his, his um, seminal book, uh, Primitive Social Organization. This became one of the standard sources used in anthropology when we start to think about and classify different types of societies. So we're really building a lot from that, those early models that we saw from Lewis Henry Morgan, uh, then we kind of moved off into a couple of areas with the neo-evolutionary concepts of energetics with Leslie White. Um, but let's get back into some of these structural elements that, that are very utilitarian when we look and try to analyze the nature of a social political organization. So El Elman Service broke societies into four categories. Uh, and, and there's a hierarchical aspect to them as far as the nature of complexity. Not to say that one is better than the other, but simply to say that one has a, a, a constellation of attributes that entail much more complex organizational principles. So the fundamental level that he works at with that we've talked about before is this band level. And what are some of the characters, let me ask you before we go to the next slide, what are some of the characteristics of a band? Dennis, can you um, can you chime in on that? Anna, I'm picking the people whose pictures I can't see. Gregory, um, actually, no, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, who can? How many people would you expect to see in a band level of society? A lot or just a few? Sounds like a few. Yeah, can you think of an example of a society in the world that is still in existence that, that functions uh, fundamentally at a band level? One of the, the best studied examples is the Bushmen of the Kalahari in, in Africa. Um, the Kalahari Desert, you know, it's a, it's a limited environment. There's some speculation that the Bushmen had been pushed there by, by the Bantu expansion. So there was other movements going on in Africa. They got pushed into this more mar marginal land uh, and they survived in, in small bands um, that could be as, as few as a half dozen or a dozen people. Um, and then when the resources allow it and, and with seasonality with rains and things, that they might gather into groups of, of you know, 50, 60, or 100 people. 
uh, but largely they're functioning at a, at a band level. Um, and everybody within the society, you know, aside from, from different statuses that might come associated with age or gender, is pretty much equal. Uh, so they have a leader often, but that leader is simply the person they agree to follow because they recognize the wisdom and, and the capabilities of that person, the experience of that person, rather than them having some sort of authority given either by a system of that grants authority, such as a, a, a vote, or um, you know some sort of inherited leadership capability. Uh, it's simply the, the the leadership of your own personal charisma and the confidence that you're able to inspire the others to follow you. So, and then uh, he uses tribes uh, and tribes. Now you start to get something a little bit more formal as far as leadership. There may be some aspects of inherited leadership associated with it, larger organizations. Um, you know, there might be some beginnings of agricultural rather than just uh, hunter hunting and gathering that they might be doing some horticulture. Uh, so you're seeing a, a, a capability for larger groups. Oftentimes they're um, associated with herding or pastoralism. Um, they have more capability of uh, maintaining a large group of people, uh, more formal uh, forms of leadership. And so you're starting to see these developmental characteristics of complexity and then chiefdoms that's where we start to get to what we would consider something that's an incipient or an emergent state so where you have a chief oftentimes who has uh, authority based on inheritance and some sort of divine uh, relationship between his family or his his person or her person and the divine forces of the world uh, Usually there's a settlement and then subordinate settlements. So there's a main settlement uh, and then um, people who would be related to that settlement through usually um, bloodlines or um, possibly simply by a, 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 some sort of political affinity. I was, I was working with a fellow once from Zimbabwe uh, when I was at Penn State University and um, one day we were talking and he mentioned that he was a prince. And, and I said, you're a prince? You know, we had no idea you were you know, of nobility. How did you become a prince? And he said, well, my father was wandering about with his family one day and he came to a piece of land where nobody was living. So he settled there, built a hut and built his village with his family. And then somebody else came along and said, oh, this is nice land. Can, can I live here also? And he said, well, yes, of course. And he, and he had them settle on the frontier, you know, out, out of ways from his village. Uh, and then some more people came and they settled out in the peripheries. And before you know it, he had a little kingdom that had associated around him uh, with him simply having been the first one there and having the personal authority and, and inspiring the confidence in people that he established a lineage. And then that was this guy's father. And so this, he, his father had become the king of a small kingdom, um, which would be what we would be talking about, you know, something like an incipient chiefdom where they're settled and he's got more and more people sitting around him, building a political institution that there's a hierarchy where he's the, the primary person for the, the chiefdom and the other people are subordinate. And then they're based on relationships, personal relationships that they have with him, either by blood relation or, or some sort of social political relationship that he's established with them by having been generous enough to grant them a piece of land to live on. Uh, if you read something like the, the Popol Vuh from the Quiche Maya in Guatemala and, and their origin myth of where their society came from, that they were also wanderers at, at a certain point, had been pushed out of their, their land, and they came to what was to become the Quiche Kingdom. And when you read this mythic tale, it's it's pretty similar to what you see, what, what my friend told me about how his father became a king in Zimbabwe. Or if you read the Bible and you look at the Jews wandering into Canaan, that they're following some of these similar um, processes where they're moving as tribes settling down, establishing more of a hierarchy and a settlement 
higher uh, structure and a social political structure, more formalized religious institutions, centers of worship and, and power, systems of taxation eventually, territorial limits and boundaries. And so you see this, this transition where people might move from one group into something that's more centralized, more hierarchical, more complex. Uh, and then states, of course, being um, the, the highest level of organization and what we're most familiar with, what evolved into the modern industrial nation states, um, where all these institutions become more layered, more complex, more formalized, more codified, uh, more diversification in, in status, in economics, in occupation, uh, in bureaucracy. Uh, so you, you build up one on top of the other. And there seems to be um, sort of a natural progression for people to move towards this complexity based on the environmental circumstances and the demographic circumstances and the opportunity when it comes up. So if we look, oh, there's a question. Yeah, like why do we say like when we build up a hierarchy, it's automatically more complex? Uh, it's, it's more complex because uh, it involves uh, more variables, more differences in it. So um, when you think of the band and it's egalitarian, you know, aside from, you know, age and, and gender, you don't have a lot of differentiation. Everybody's a hunter gatherer. If someone doesn't want to obey you, there's no way that you're going to make them obey you. Um, and you're, you're all more or less involved in all the same activities within the society. You go to a tribal society, and now you've got someone who's acting as a head person. I talk, talk about uh, Papua New Guinea, um, where someone becomes a big man in a, in a village. This is very much a tribal sort of organization. The big man has his authority based on his, his success he's in raising pigs, usually. Uh, so he's got a little more wealth than everybody else. And then he usually throws a party when he has enough pigs and gives away all those pigs, all that pig meat to everybody. So he, he shares it out, thereby getting more authority because people feel indebted to him because he shared that, that wealth. In a society like that, if he kept accumulating the wealth and then tried to get other people's pigs in sort of a capitalist system, probably he'd end up dead or exiled from the village because people wouldn't appreciate that because it would be too much of a violation of the social mores and acceptance of how people should relate to each other. If one person started to grab too much um, wealth within the village. There's wealth. It's a, a basic concept of, of your, your ability to produce food. Um, but when you have enough, you share it out. Uh, if you move to something like the Kwaki Udo, who we mentioned before from the Northwest, and they would have something called a potlatch. And here you have something that's clearly moved beyond that big man level of society where you go to a chiefly level of society, but they're still using some of those practices where the chief would be, would on a regular festival cycle, invite the subordinate chiefs to his, his village and he would give them gifts. And it was a redistribution of wealth. And so it was a way of solidifying those relationships. Uh, and you'll, you see the same sort of thing going on in the Pacific and the Trobian Islands, for instance, they had something called the Kulagring, where you would have gifts that would rotate around from villages to villages. And it would, the trade became a means of maintaining social relations, but also was a, a way of, of um, creating a semi-formal hierarchical relationship. So what you start to see is that there's differentiations going on in, in the roles of people within the society. So you have you know, the chief, um, the chief's family, maybe chief's relatives who might have some villages outside or within the village. You might have someone who now who's the chief warrior, you know, the, 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 the general for the tribe or for the village, a, a specialized position used for military. Um, and so, uh, it's complex because there are simply more possibilities in the system. So, so complexity is simply a measure, really, of the amount of variation possible within it in the categories that we're looking at. 
that make sense? Yeah, but I mean, when I encounter an individual and I can like just put a label on it, okay, it belongs to this and the status, it's like, it also makes it a lot more simplified because if I look, if everyone is like equal, then I have to like look at the person like as an individual and like just put like the individual um, con like contribute, which makes it also more complex to differentiate between the people. Sure, and, and a lot of what you're talking about are, are personality and, and biological differences that we all have, and of course, those are fundamental to us as individuals. Um, but what we're looking at in this case is the is the social structure, um, and I mean, you could go down to the personality level and say, well, my relationship with you is different than my relationship with you and with you, so it's actually very complex. But when you look at it in, from, you know, particularly from a materialist perspective, as far as the amount of wealth that we might have, um, you know, the amount of authority, I mean, we have a certain relationship and you might listen to what I say, or you might not. Um, but if I have more authority, you may not have a choice to, but to listen to me because of the authority and status that I have in a more structured, complex society. But so, say that communism is also like really complex and it didn't have as much hierarchy as maybe like in chapter? Uh, again, it's a, that's the theory. I don't know that that's ever been the case in practice. If you look at the, the social economic hierarchy within most communist states that I'm aware of, it's it's been as well developed as any capitalist society, I think. Um, even if there's an ideology that might say otherwise and an ideal, um, that there, there's a reality that Olympian athletes would have much more access to wealth and, and, and status and, and gifts, for instance, or the, the people within the Politburo and the, in the hierarchy of, of the uh, um, bureaucracy or the people associated with the military or, or the Secret Service or the KGB. So, so that in a, in, in a conceptual ideal, Sure, and you know, conceptual ideal. America has a democracy, you know, that where everybody's equal, but it isn't isn't the reality. Is that we have these ideals when we form our political um, structures? Is something that we've evolved as we've gotten into nation states and complex states from thousands of years of philosophy, you know, throughout the Enlightenment and bringing together what we knew about how humans behave and how we can organize ourselves, and we create these ideals these utopias that we, we we long for, we just haven't really, I don't think anyone's ever really fit the, you know, hit the, the nail on the head when it comes to actually structuring a state that can function in that way. Um, after November, maybe we'll fix it in America. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, yeah. Um, there's a certain level when you're, we're looking at structural aspects of society that um, it, it may seem like it, it uh, ignores or, or doesn't pay sufficient attention to the role of the individual. And there is a post-processual movement, a, a movement that's come around um, you know, in the last 50 years in, in theory that looks at agency, looks at the role of the individual and, and pays more attention to that. But when we're looking at the rise and fall of a complex society, I mean, individual personalities may have a lot to do with it, and, and it's something that we're going to have to consider and understand, but it's the actions of that individual and the ramifications of those actions in the larger society that are going to matter to us. Because, you know, what, what goes on in the White House and, and you know, um, Donald Trump and, and Eric Trump may not like each other as a father and son, uh, unless that's having ramifications out into the structure of the society, you know, like um, Eric decides to destroy the healthcare system because he's mad at Donald, you know, it, it doesn't really much matter when we're trying to understand the society, those personality aspects of it. So, um, you know, those really fall more into the fields of psychology or some aspects of sociology. Um, not that they're irrelevant, to understanding this, but only if they bleed out into the larger structural elements of, of the society. So not disregarding what you're saying, because it's absolutely true. Of course, we're all individuals and 
and we all have a, a level of complexity and differentiation between us. But uh, when we're looking at, at how we organize ourselves in, into groups of people, that's what we want to understand and, and reduce to these, these major trends and forces that, that guide our, our association and as well as our disassociation. Good. Other questions? I mean, does the hierarchy make it also simple? Yeah, well, all models by nature are reductionist, right? So the world is is naturally complex. You know, I you know I can look at you as an individual, or I could look at you as you know one billion different cells interacting with each other. Um, but if I want to understand you as an individual, probably the level of resolution I want to look at is you as an individual, not you know, your skin cells or, or um, you know, uh, things like that. If I'm a doctor and I'm trying to treat a skin condition, that would be something different. But uh, so so we, we, we are always reducing a very complex world into simpler, understandable uh, units that allow us to analyze, you know, a level of analysis that we're looking at. So it depends what you're trying to study. All right, so here, uh, just a uh, kind of a condensed chart looking at some of the characteristics. If you go down uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you have membership, government, economy, society, and then going across the top, band, tribe, chiefdom, and state. So when you look at a band, um, the classifications that service is using that are pretty much accepted uh, in, in this type of modeling in anthropology are you know a dozen or so people, um, the, the nature of the government's egalitarian. There's no bureaucracy. There's no monopoly of force, like we talked about um, Weber and, and the nature of the state, that the state owns a monopoly of force. There is no monopoly of force uh, in an egalitarian society. Uh, conflict resolution is usually done by talking things out or somebody who's older mediating a conflict. You know, um, your, your family in some ways might act in a band level of organization. Uh, usually you don't call the police in on each other when you're having a, a dispute or, or sue each other in court. Uh, you try to sort things out within the household. Um, again, there's no hierarchy of settlement. There's not a major town and then a smaller town and then a village uh, and then a farmstead. You know, what you might have in, in some levels of, of more complex societies. Here, there's only one level of settlement, oftentimes with band level societies. It's a temporary seasonal settlement as well. So where they move uh, as they follow the food sources. The economy is mostly just reciprocal. So it's just based on an on a exchange. I share with you, you share with me. Um, there's no wealth, no, um, no, no marketing or, or, or heavy bargaining or anything like that. But it's just simply a sharing uh, 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 relationship uh, economically. And then there's just simply no levels of complexity in, in the society uh, as far as stratification, you know, no slaves, that means, um, usually no public architecture. Um, you know, literacy is, is limited to just your, your local language, um, maybe some trade languages or things like that. So just, just not a lot of complexity in all these different aspects of the society. If we go to a tribe, now you're talking about organization in the hundreds. Um, it, it could be, settlement pattern might be mobile or fixed, like we said, because a lot of tribes tend to be pastoralist. That tends to lend itself readily to this type of, of organization. One thing about a tribal organization, it's very fluid. So you can be grouped together or if things are hard because of uh, environmental conditions, changes in the seasons, or conflict, you can dis dissipate also. You can disband into smaller and smaller groups. And so it's a very fluid system. Um, so that mobility is very useful in it. Uh, often your relationships, your, your fundamental organization is based on your kinship relationships, so extended families. Uh, you might be marrying, marrying exogamously into other tribes, and building these relationships. Um, your government 
is, is still largely egalitarian. We've talked about the concept of the big man in Papua New Guinea. Um, conflict resolution tends to be informal. Uh, again, you know, there are times where I, I've been in conflict situations in Papua New Guinea, and we sit down and we talk about it to avoid any bloodshed. Um, and just, you know, what can we do to make you happy? And, and um, now nowadays, occasionally they'll go to court or they'll still go to bloodshed about it if they can't, can't resolve it. But usually, you know, there's a, a set series of informal ways of behaving uh, that allow people to resolve conflicts um, without um, resorting to formal judges or things like that. People who have respect might serve to in that capacity, but it's not a formal title that they have. Um, I forgot to share the slides with you, didn't I? Someone just told me, you guys can speak up, you know. <laughs> we thought it's supposed to be like that. So. Oh, um, I'm, I'm going to scroll back a little bit. I must have been doing such a good job of explaining that you didn't feel like you needed the slides. All right, so we talked about Elman Service, just a shot of his book, and then the... Um, the different levels of organization. And I will put the slides up on our Canvas website and make those available to you. And then obviously you can see the streaming videos are available on YouTube. So uh, we we're just talking about this table. I, I apologize greatly for that. I uh, got ahead of myself, I guess. Because I'm sitting here looking at the slides. <laughs> All right. So uh, egalitarian, and then um, the nature of the economy is still uh, functions largely on a reciprocal basis. A lot of times these pastoralists and these tribal organizations have relationships with more settled, perhaps more centralized groups. And so they may be involved in a lot of barter where they're exchanging animals for, for farm products and things like that. Uh, and so, so they're, you know, oftentimes not in isolation that they're, they're um, how they deal internally might be a little bit different with how they're dealing with uh, a different people externally. People who might even be related but have entered into a different level of subsistence where they're settled agriculturalists versus the people who might be living in these uh, more marginal lands or steppes um, or mountains and are, are using more of a pastoral form of life. Um, again, control of land is often following descent. Uh, oftentimes it's not, like as we talked about before, that land isn't a formal ownership, but it's more of associated to the larger group, and there could be overlap with other groups. Uh, and again, the society is not really stratified. It doesn't have, well, it doesn't, the, the category he says here is no slavery. There are occasions where you might have, uh, again, be based on these relationships with external um, cultures, that they may, in some cases, take on slavery. Um, luxury goods are, are limited. Um, public architecture, very limited again. Um, indigenous literature, also, um, you know, very limited to, you know, to just what they use in oral traditions. So it's often how they, they carry on the, um, the, the heritage and the cultural identity. Chieftains can get quite large, and so they can get up to thousands of people. Um, usually there's at least a two-level hierarchy. We'll, we'll take a look at that later as we get to talk about territorial limits. Um, that you have what uh, is referred to here as rank. So people have statuses based on a rank, and that might be in how close they are related to the chief of the society. Um, and so, so you're, you're getting more formal statuses within the society that you weren't seeing before in the tribe or band. And now as they settle down, you have more complex settlement structure. Um, you're, you're getting these people who actually have specialized roles within the society based on, on their authority within the bureaucracy, their relationship to the gods, the relationship to the king. Um, if you look at like Hawaiian 
um, leadership, the the nobility um, are considered to be imbued with mana. So they have this, this spiritual aspect of it, this, this power that comes from the gods. And so the amount of mana you have then helps determine where you are in the rank within the society. Uh, so again, the, the government is centralized. You're focused on what we would call nowadays an executive officer, an executive branch within the, the, the organization. Um, you have levels of bureaucracy beginning. Uh, so there, you might have to go through certain people, uh, oftentimes religious bureaucracy associated with taxation, with, associated with worship, things like that, warfare. Um, the hierarchy of the settlement, again, one settlement is the paramount settlement, the, the primary settlement, and then there would be other satellite settlements associated with it. Um, food production is become intensive, so you're settled, it means you're using intensive agriculture. Uh, you've got redistribution now, so people in those villages outside the paramount chief, uh, chief's village will probably be giving tribute to the chief and, and making payments in, in return for being part of the society, having the protection militarily. Um, and then in many cases, the, the paramount chief might be involved in some redistribution. If you're having something happens to your fields or there's an accident or your house burns down, that people from the uh, main village or uh, organized labor may come to help you then, or the chief may bring food to you to help mitigate the the threat that that happened to your village um you mentioned the ranking uh you have more probability of slavery occurring uh and you, you also have more development of literacy so as people settle you have start to have more specialists and there's a greater opportunity for the development of some sort of system for writing or, or creating uh, some sort of monomic device as people formalize and codify their ideology, sometimes their finances, um, you know, who's paid tribute so you can keep record of those things. So you have more need for record keeping both on the spiritual level, the sacred level, uh, which helps um, uh, justify the uh, authority of the chief and the priests, uh, but also then you know the aspects that that keep the pledge, the the the, um, the records for uh, the amounts of tribute and the relationships. It might be kinship relationship charts also. And then of course we have the state where your population, the pre-industrial state, where your population is growing to tens of thousands on upward, with many layers of uh, social uh, settlement hierarchy from a capital city to regional capitals to um, subordinate uh, towns and villages and, and farmsteads. Um, centralized, more centralized than the chiefdom. Uh, you start to have a need for laws and judges when you have a lot of people living together, you have more conflict, more need to be able to resolve these conflicts in a very formal way there has to be a sense of justice within the society because if there's not justice and people are going to be very discontent if they feel like they're not being treated accordingly um, by some sort of protection from the society then then they're they're going to feel disenfranchised from that society and they're, you're more likely to rebel or to work against the society for, um, to to try to gain some sort of sense of legitimacy. So you're substituting the equality that happens in a band level where people are just in their interpersonal relationships or are working well with each other to something that's a much more formalized way of maintaining a sense of justice and, and equality. Um, so again, the economy is much more in, intensive as far as the food production. And, and then you have uh, many more layers of social status or class or sometimes uh, a caste system such as you see in India where people are assigned to particular roles within the society based on their birth 
Uh, in some cases, it might be based on achievement or, or something that's uh, um, ascribed. The bureaucracy becomes very formal in some states, such as China, where you can test into particular statuses uh, through education and then and then demonstration of your ability to enter into the bureaucracy. Um, Slavery can be quite large scale at this point. So, so if you think of our materialist models and our Marxian models, right, that, that slavery becomes a, a, a way of maximizing or optimizing your production based on, you know, putting a greater labor cost on the lower classes. Uh, much greater chance of public architecture, which would have begun in the chiefdom level, but with the state, now you really see it taking off. And of course, literacy, um, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, the foundations of what we have in our modern society. So looking at pre-industrial political systems off on the left side, you see uh, the ones that would be classified as centralized. So the states and the chiefdoms, so stratified and ranked societies. So the, again, the ranking usually based on kinship and then stratified usually based on much, a much more complex system that combines bureaucracy, perhaps kinship, uh, wealth uh, accumulated through marketing or land ownership, things like that. And then you have uncentralized or decentralized or egalitarian um, types of organization. So which includes the tribes and the bands uh, and so when we talk about complex societies, we're talking on the centralized side. Um, that's recognizing that there, there is a dichotomy in human organization. Uh, and while recognizing that humans and organize ourselves in what's really a continuum, right? That, that there's not, because we're, especially because we're looking at multiple variants, that there's not something, any one single thing that you might say forces you into being centralized or decentralized. But if you plot these all together and uh, on a, on a uh, graph, that what you'll see is that it's, it's, it's kind of bimodal in the distribution of how people uh, organize themselves on the planet. And there are some in between states, but they tend not to last very long and that people will either move one way or decentralize and break down in a different way. Um, again, as was brought up, that these are reductionist models and these are tools that we use for trying to understand society and that you can find lots of examples that won't fit into these templates exactly. So they're generalized models that help us understand societies and, and allow us to do comparative analysis by having certain standards that we're looking at rather than it trying to look at everything all at once and just saying, well, everybody's so unique that we can't compare them in any way. Uh, let's see. Um, if you are putting your hand up, sometimes I can't see it uh, on the participant list. So um, it's okay to chime in while I'm talking. Uh, so at the same time period that, that Elman Service in the 1960s is, is publishing his work, we have Morton Fried comes along with a very similar, I think, conceptually idea of how to look at the structure of complex societies. So in his book, uh, the evolution of political society, he uses three categories. So he looks at egalitarian, ranked, and stratified. So egalitarian societies, um, Vesely, you want to read that one for us? Okay. Uh, well. Um, societies are those in which status differentiation and political leadership are situational and based on personal achievement uh, 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 and based on personal achievement within the limits of age and sex under conditions of generally equal access to economic resources. 
Okay. So what does that sound like in terms of what Elma's service was describing? A band, yeah. So following the same precepts of the band. What's that? I talked over somebody there. It was just echo. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So so yeah, so so he's looking at a band. Like I said, we're looking at a continuum of human behavior and, and social political organization. So you know that that service uses four categories and um, free uses three major categories. We're, we're talking about some of the same attributes, just different ways of trying to group them and organize them and emphasizing different aspects of them. So if we go to a ranked society, um, Elisabetta, can you read that? Which one, me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, societies that employ ranking as a structural principle for integrating multiple communities along kinship lines. Ranking of individuals and um, lineages is based on primo, uh, primogeniture, in which rank is hierarchically related to descent from an ethical ancestor. The shift is Elman Services typology. Yeah. So, so yeah, so the, the, the primogeniture, the focusing on the inheritance, right? Um, in that case, you know, the, the firstborn of the, of the chief. Um, and, and having an identity tied to some sort of ancestral worship. We mentioned the Jews before, right? And so who's the, the, the ancestral founder of the Jewish religion, considered one of the, you know, the patriarch of the Jewish religion is... Abraham, right? And and you have that divine authority that goes to Abraham, right? Originally, he's Abram. And then when he accepts or forms that, formalizes that relationship with God, his name changes to Abraham. So, so he then imbues the, the Jewish people and his lineage with that holy, you know, that, that sacred legitimacy that comes from that relationship with God, a, a lineage that passes all the way down to Jesus Christ then, right? So, so you see these, these type of structures um, that they can devolve, evolve and mature over hundreds or even thousands of years where they uh, retain much of the identity, eventually the Jewish religion, with, you know, Abraham comes out of Mesopotamia, somewhere in 19th or 18th century BC. Uh, the Jews end up in Egypt, leave Egypt probably in the 12th century BC during that time of the collapse of the Bronze Age, when, when there's all sorts of turmoil going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. And then when they were in exile in Babylon, that's when they begin to codify their whole religion. So, so now the, the, the priests, actually write down the religion and then it gets codified into what becomes our Bible, into the, the Torah, the five books of Moses. So you're talking from 19th century down to, you know, the eighth century when, when things get written down, you know, a thousand years of oral tradition that are being passed that, that, that uh, legitimize the hierarchy within the, the tribal organization uh, and then eventually, of course, it, it evolves into once they, they leave Egypt and they become a, a state level of organization when they conquer and develop the kingdoms within within Palestine or, or Canaan. Um, so you can see how things can mature and evolve along these, these kind of ranked ideas um, and this apical ancestor concept that Again, you know, we, we do, as we mentioned uh, earlier this week, we do carry on aspects of that into our modern nation states when we look at, as I said, George Washington or, or Lenin, uh, that those, we still retain some of those ideas of some sort of legitimacy based on this apical ancestor, this, this person who brought a, a vision to the world and that we then carry on that, that vision in our social and political and ideological organization. 
and then stratified societies. Uh, Tatiana, do you want to read that one for me? Yeah. Societies emerged from rank groups that developed differential access to basic productive resources, such as land and water. Control and management of strategic resources provides opportunities for certain individuals to accumulate material wealth, which can be manipulated to generate social or political capital. For instance, by establishing a reciprocal return obligation vis-a-vis -vis contractual debt relationships. Yeah, no, very good. No, no, perfect. No, very good. Um, so, so here we're getting into, you know, these, you can really see manifesting these driving forces that, that are inherent in Marxian and materialist theory, right? So here you're getting that differentiation of wealth, you're getting that contractual relationships, indebtedness, um, you know, formalized slavery, you know, and, and even, you know, codified slavery where the slaves have rights and, and it's a, it's a socioeconomic position. Um, not just I beat you and now you have to do what I say, but, but the, there are certain rights and obligations with, within that status in a lot of these societies. Um, and, and you can enter into indebtedness just by borrowing money and not being able to pay it back. And that might put you into a level of, of servitude. So you, you're getting all these levels of, of differentiation, uh, mostly based on wealth in, within the society. And this is, a, this is what Fried is emphasizing in this stratified societies. And of course, this is, is the foundation of our modern capitalist nation states. Okay, Jay, Jay, may I ask a question? Yeah. So you said that in this society, you're always based on wealth, right? But isn't this wealth connected to the kinship or it worked in another way? It, it can be or it may not be um, in the stratified society. It depends on, on uh, some of it's very particular to a culture history of it. Um, you know, what you begin to see with stratified societies often is someone who's able to achieve their status not by primogeniture, um, not by what they inherited, but by what they're able to accomplish. And so the, again, this is that ideal of capitalism again that, that you know that we hold within American society and a lot of other societies in the world is that we we believe in that you know just like in the band level that. People are going to follow you because of your charisma, because you're respected, it, that it's based on your merit, a meritocracy, that I have authority because I earned that authority by earning people's respect. We have this ideal in capitalism that I earned my money because I was an accomplished capitalist. I was very good at managing money. I was smarter than everybody else in the Darwinian sense, that I outcompeted people and therefore I earned more wealth. And, and so it's based on my merits, my meritocracy. The reality, of course, is that we never did give up, in general, the concept of primogeniture, of inheritance, of, of manipulation of the system. And, and so, again, there's that, that, that utopian ideal, and then there's that reality that we're stuck with, which is usually you know, not, not so good. And the reason why we end up with things like French revolutions or Russian revolutions is people get, um, you know, they, they they want that ideal. They want more of that ideal that that they know could exist, and, and it is brought to the forefront when you have philosophers like Marx, um, you know, who, who say, "Look, it doesn't have to be this way." Um, so, so yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that those concepts. We see some of those showing up in Michael Mann's work, right? And this concept of, of why we tend not to uh, rebel. So again, just looking at the organization, band, tribe, chiefdom, um, and then this shows you your agricultural state and your industrial state, and it shows the difference between a, a centralized versus a decentralized uh, relationship between settlements. So here you have, again, that paramount chiefdom with the tributary towns and villages uh, versus one where you, you have a group of villages who, who might have all sorts of exchange in, in goods, economic relationships, and intermarriage, but but no one um, 
settlement is is better or more powerful than the other settlements. So they maintained a decentralized level of organization. Um, it's not hierarchical. All right, so let's talk a little bit about social power. Um, Daria, do you want to read that for me? Daria Kozabinikova. <laughs> whose name I never pronounce right. Individuals are influenced by social interactions. Individual psychs are affected in inter interactions with others. Perceptions of peer pressure, fear of social, economic, or legal consequences. What motivates people as a society to cooperate for good or ill? Yeah, so when I think about social power, it's, it's that force. Um, we talk about our individual psyches, what in our psyche makes us get along with each other. So kind of moving from, was it Alyssa who talked about the, the, the role of the individual, uh, you know, that, that we could break down society into, you know, you could break down America into 320 million individuals and try to analyze it in that regard. But there's something that creates a, a, a cooperative relationship that my psyche and your psyche are going to work together to do things and accomplish things together. And so what we want to try to understand is, is what is going on in that relationship, right? There's that, that concept that Durkheim talked about of solidarity, where we all want to you know, get along and that we have these relationships that form either organically or mechanically. Uh, but is there something else another way to look at that and to try to explain why we're able to work together to some sort of common goal. So there might be different theoretical approaches we can take a, a look at, but one thing is to recognize that, that our, again, looking at that individual psyche, but that we belong to a lot of different spheres of social power. And so here is just a, is one way of kind of grouping it, looking at it. At the very top here, we're talking about the, an ideological level. Uh, someone give me an example of, of how you personally are involved in some sort of social power network based on ideology. I think the most uh, popular example is religion. For sure. instance, yeah, so uh, uh, on all religion, I am an atheist uh, and I am more interested in, uh, yeah, in in these practices without church, without traditions uh, and so on. So is your ideology atheism? I cannot say that I have an ideology because right now I am confused, but we can, for, for our <laughs> example, we can we can say that, yeah. Okay, because you're confused. <laughs> All right, uh, fair enough. But uh, what, one might look at atheism or secular humanism, the idea that the fundamental basis for humans treating each other well doesn't require any sort of divine intervention. It's still an ideology. It's still a system of belief, a worldview that guides our, 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 our interactions based on kind of a higher level of, of ideals, of, of concepts, whether it's divinely uh, derived or derived simply by a recognition of human nature and, and the realization that we're all stuck on the planet together and the best way to interact is, you know, through some sort of um, mutual respect and cooperation. So how about an intergroup level of um, uh, social power, social relationships, social networking? I'm not sure, but maybe we can use uh, the concept of our group works, for instance, or even our course, where we are uh, uh, we are united by uh, the same interests. 
Absolutely. I think the school would be a good example of that, and, and it can be broken down into multiple layers of groups. So we're looking at these big categories, but each of these, of course, are broken down into many, many different um, uh, other types of, of overlapping categories. So yeah, within the school, you know, the, the School for Advanced Studies, that we have a certain shared identity, we have a certain goal and cooperation and, and learning, uh, doing research. Um, and so, yeah, that gives us an identity. Um, I have a sweatshirt next to me that has the logo on it, right? So I even can, can wear the, uh, the symbol. Um, and, and you may have paraphernalia also that, that identifies you as part of that group. Uh, how about interpersonal level? Maybe with our parents or friends? I'm not sure. Um, the, well, usually if we're talking about interpersonal, it might be, be outside your, your family group. So if you get down to intrapersonal, I think you, you're jumping in on, on that level. So, so that's really your fundamental level of, of social organization. But interpersonal might be your social group that you're out. If you go out or belong to a sports club or something like that, um, that there might be, well, sports club might be too big for that. But if you go out drinking with somebody, not that any of you guys go out drinking, but uh, no, no one goes out drinking now anyways. So, um, but you, you, know, you might go out to uh, take a walk in the park or go sailing or skiing or something like that. So, so these relationships that are external that you might develop bonds and relationships with, um, you know, become part of your personality, part of the social force. You know, your interpersonal friend may call you for help at some point and you may go to help them. Uh, or vice versa. So they, there's a network that you can that is, becomes part of your life, is influential to you, um, but it's not it's not a formalized uh, level of network. And then of course the interpersonal one at the very fundamental level of, of us interacting with our spouses, our families. So let's talk about Michael Mann's work a little bit. Then the sources of social power. This I think is one of the most powerful models for studying complex societies. I find it very useful in a lot of different ways. Um, I, it has a lot of resonance to me because he encapsulates a lot of the ideas that we've talked about with some of these previous theorists, um, but it's also got enough flexibility in it to look at things from a, a multivariate perspective, uh, to capture a lot of the, the complexities and the subtleties, and, and yet very powerful forces for change uh, and, and creating that social cohesion and, and taking it at the very large level and yet making it able to reflect it back onto yourself. Why am I acting this way within my society? What are the, those powers, those influences that are, are, are affecting me? So again, looking at us as an individual, that we have all these overlapping spheres. So here's a Venn diagram, but, and that's just a few of the spheres that you might be able to, to draw. And of course, each of those spheres can be broken up into many, many other spheres. But you've got a government that you belong to. You've got your family that you belong to. You've got your social or church groups that you belong to. And that you're in the middle there um, working within these groups, being influenced by these groups on how you behave, how you accept the structure of society or helping you shape how you might want to build a society to be different in the future and your understanding of what the society was like in the past. So working at the, the basic level of who we are, man sees us as a, a creature that tries to strive to achieve our goals. And that to achieve our goals, this is best done in a cooperative rela uh, relationship. That we're not that successful at being able to achieve our larger goals of, of life and what we want to accomplish as an individual. I mean, we, you can you know, go out into the wilderness and live by yourself uh, and your goal might just simply be surviving. But once we start to get involved in these social networks and these social groups, your goals might be to achieve status within that group might be to achieve wealth, you know, using the system. Um, and, and you can't do it by yourself. You have to do it through a series of interactions with other people and other groups. Um, 
So when we were looking at a materialist perspective that um, we would look at that wealth as being the, the, the source of my authority or my power or my status or within the stratified society. But what Matt's saying is that it's not these things so much as matter, but the influence that these things have. It's the power. And that that is like the, you know, if you look at a, a, a light bulb, well, you have to connect a copper wire to the light bulb so that the current can pass through it. But it's not the copper wire that's important, it's the current that's important. So power passes through these different aspects of society, these different aspects of things that we have, of the bureaucracy that we have, of the um, weapons that we have, but it's the power and the effect of that power that he's interested in and that he's talking about um, forming and shaping the complexity of our societies. So he sees two key elements. Uh, let me. Um, Sonia, you want to read number uh, one and two for us, please? Do you mean me? Yeah, please. Two key elements to man's approach to the study of society. First, they overlap in networks of social interaction, not dimensions, levels, or factors of single social totality. This follows from my first statement. Second, there are also organizations, institutional means of attaining, attaining human goals. So, so when he's looking at society, um, he's, he's looking at it as multivariate, right? It's not just a, a single aspect of it. Um, and he's seeing that these organizations that we have mean something to us and influence our behavior because they uh, I lost something here because they allow us to accomplish and achieve those things that we want to achieve. So then he, he looks at, at power as far as the extent and intensity as well. And so he looks at, um, whoops, it should be just intensive there on the left and extensive below that. And then he compares that or cross references that in the matrix with authoritative and diffused power. So when you think about the level of a state or organization, um, as an example for authoritative and intensive, he uses an army command structure. So why is that authoritative and intensive? Because uh, it is based on uh, looking for each person, like controlling him tightly. And because we have some power, like one source of power. Yeah, so the, the lines of authority are very clear. They're very limited that you know who the general is, the person who's in charge, and you know where you fall exactly in that stratified system. It's a very closed system. It doesn't it doesn't branch out. It doesn't allow intrusion coming in very easily. So yeah, so it's this intensive and author authoritative. How about intensive diffused? Where he talks about he uses an example as a general strike. Why is that intensive and diffused? Who's usually uh, uh, behind a, a general strike? Like a labor union? Yeah, some people, some group of people. So that is why we, ha we have no any, um, yeah, any direct power. Right, that the, the, the authoritative structure is somewhat loose usually, might be combining a bunch of different groups. Say you're having a, a, a climate change general strike to, to try and push your country to, to be more proactive about, about saving the environment for your generation. 
Um, so it might be different groups. There's no real clear line of authority um, that that it might be very intense that you have a very dedicated group within it um, that are operating within a limited sphere, but but author the authority within that group is very diffused. So then he looks at extensive and authoritative and, and talks about a militaristic empire. So comparing that to the intensive authoritative with an army command structure, now we're talking about a militaristic empire. How does the empire often organize itself? So here again, we, we don't know who is the general, as we can say, but uh, there is a group of people, politicians probably, uh, who spread the power. Well, you, you, it often might incorporate this, that, that, that intensive command structure that you have in, in, at the intensive level, but because it's an empire, that it's, it's working in boundaries that far, re, you, know, you reach out far beyond that, that core. And so oftentimes an empire is based on some sort of hierarchical relationship with client states. So that, that other state might have its own king and its own general, but, it, but we're extending out into a larger network. So uh, when we look at settlement patterns, again, you, you know, we talked about there being that primary chief location and then you know, a, a series of satellites. If you go into a more complex level, you might have that primary chief and then, you know, the state capital over here, and that may have a set within it of, of, of satellite settlements within it. And each of those may have a set of satellite uh, um, settlements. And so what you have is a much more extended network where you have different lines of authority coming together. And so so it's extensive as opposed to being very nucleated and, and, and much more contained. Um, and then he talks about uh, diffused extensive as far as a market exchange. And again, we're looking at something that, that's reaching out over a wide area with, with uh, even less means of control or authority within that market. Um, you know, if it's a competing market, which, which most markets will naturally have some aspects of, of competition within it, um, you've got different people competing for, for market share. Um, you've got different networks. You have people establishing new trade routes. And so you're talking about wide areas being covered um, and, and no direct lines of authority for the most part, except for your regulation that might come from within your corporate structure or within your, with your government or transnational um, organizations. So, so he uses this as a way to try and look at our complex societies um, our networks of social power and and understand how they're being manifest on in space. So he takes the concept of social stratification, which is you know inherent in these complex societies and social power, and he says it's the um, it uses a definition that social stratification is the overall creation and distribution of power within the society. So that if we want to understand the, those concepts of complex societies, as we talked about with service or talked about with uh, Freed or, or even Marx, that he's seeing these networks of social power as being that, that it's their distribution within the society, society that determine how that society is going to be stratified. And of course, the, the heart of what man talks about are these, these four concepts of social power. So ideological power, economic power, military power, and political power. And he, he refers to it as the IEMP model. I actually never really heard of anyone refer to it that way except for him and me when I'm imitating him. But ideological power, so it, uh, actually, uh, Sofia Fedorova, you want to read this one? Okay, ideological power derives from the human need to find the ultimate meaning in life, to share knowledge and values, and to participate in aesthetic and ritual practices with others. Okay, 
Uh, I don't think we need to elaborate on it. I think we all have a pretty good idea what ideological power is, unless there's questions. Um, who have I not called on? Uh, Leonid, you, you there? Do you want to uh, read this one? Uh, economic power derives from the human need to extract, transform, distribute, and consume the products of nature. Economic relations are powerful because they combine the intensive mobilization of labor with very extensive circuits of capital, trade, and production chains, providing a combination of intensive and extensive power, and normally also of authoritative and diff diffused power. Okay, excellent. And Dennis, are you there? No? About uh, Anna, Anna Trevino, do you want to read this one? No? Andre? All right. Uh, military power is uh, the social organization of concentrated and little violence. We can include police agencies in this definition as well. All right. So Michael Mann talks about it, and, he, and he's really kind of drawing on, on the concept that Weber put forward before, right? That, that, that the state has the monopoly of violence. Uh, Michael Mann doesn't really talk about much about, about policing or internal um, for us, he usually refers to it more in this external, looking at interstate relationships or the or the larger model of, of military organization. I include police work into this when we think about um, this monopoly of force because we, as individuals within the state, that's definitely a factor of the state. For some of us, it might be one of the most powerful factors that we have to encounter and that might um, affect what our behavior is going to be. So when you talk about networks of social power um, under quarantine, that if you go out and abuse the rules that you might be subject to fine or even imprisonment. Um, and so that, that when we think about why we behave and, and act and cooperate in a way, we might be behaving and, and cooperating uh, in a way to prevent the spread of the virus for our mutual protection and for protection of the people who are most vulnerable to the virus. But we also might be doing it because we don't want to pay the penalty of getting caught for violating the rules of the quarantine or of the lockdown. So I think it's really important to understand the internal aspects of, again, military or paramilitary uh, power within a society and how those um, affect our behavior in maintaining the cohesion and the solidarity of behavior, of action, acting for a common goal within the society. So just some examples on, on some of these aspects and from, from, from my life, you know, and, and again, maybe why I feel obligated to, to include police work. I started out at college as a police officer in, in America. So I was an agent of the government enforcing the laws to the point where if you didn't conform to laws, I might come and kick down your door and put you in handcuffs and, and take you to jail. And so to me, that was a very powerful coercive aspect of state force. Um, and that as individuals, you know, I, I felt it was my duty that I was doing something good for society. Um, in that it helped protect other people within the society. Uh, but uh, it was also very clear that it was one of the ultimate expressions of state force. And then I did some work with the military, um, searching for the remains of missing soldiers from past wars after I'd gotten my PhD in archaeology. Uh, again, I, I, I was it was on a social level or personal level, it was rewarding to bring home the remains of people who had disappeared decades before to the family so that they could bury them and recognize the sacrifice they'd made for their country. But I was also aware that it was a means of, of working in state propaganda. 
that the state would use this to try to rally people to behave according to how the state wanted them to behave. Um, and perhaps most vivid in that picture of uh, Donald Trump when he was able to get the North Koreans to give back the remains of 50 soldiers who had died during the Korean War in the 1950s, um, that here this became a very big propaganda piece for, for the president of the United States, which he used to reinforce his legitimacy and status as the ruler of the country, as the executive officer for the country. So, and, and those bodies then came to our laboratory in Hawaii, where we would then identify them and send them back to the families. Um, so when you start to think about these things, and, and, and sometimes I think when we're looking at theory, it's easy to, to roll off into these abstract ideas of what it means when we're talking about military force or um, ideology or, or political um, uh, power, but we need to recognize that, that we are actually both affected by it, but also part of these power networks within the state, within the complex society, in that our actions are either reinforcing or neutral or, or, or attacking or trying to change the structure of our society. So looking at a, the diagram that Michael Mann presents us, um, so here he, he sees us as human beings pursuing their goals on the far left, and then, um, which he says is like the original motor of why we buy in and participate in these power networks, and then the creation of multiple social networks, um, and then the objectives that he sees in this in this four-tiered system that, that he's used to model social power, ideology, uh, transcendence, um, some sort of metaphysical appeasement, perhaps a promise of heaven after you die, um, different things that, that it's gonna help you achieve as, as part of your personal goal in life. Uh, economy, circuits of praxis, using the Marxian term of, of production, of, of the productivity of the society. So how to, how to manipulate and work within these things to, to better your position, perhaps, if that's your goal, or maybe it's to make a lot of money than to share with other people. Whatever it might be, that that becomes the means, the power network that you have to work within to be able to achieve that goal. Or military, the concentrated coercive force. Um, for some, you know, it, it might be something that you're afraid of, for others, it might be a way to empower yourself, to become a member of the military and feel more powerful, um, to travel and see the world as a, as a representative of your country. Um, so, so whatever your personal goal is, that, that may be, you may be buying into that network, supporting the state and the, and, the, and the power network that the state is using to maintain its status as a complex society in the world, but you're achieving certain personal goals in there as well. America, the military is paid quite well. A lot of people go in for the money. Um, it's, a, it's a way to have both economic security, um, you, your housing is paid for, you, you get a good salary, you have a, a promise of retirement. Um, it's one of the most secure ways of getting through life in this, in this really um, difficult economic world that we live in now of, of having a secure way of getting through. Uh, when I was a police officer, a lot of my friends who I went through the police academy with and who I served with, uh, who stayed in the police force, are retired now. They retired at you know, 50, 55 years old, 52 years old, with a very healthy retirement. Uh, and they're living very good, comfortable lives in, into their 50s because it was a, a good retirement system associated with working for, in this case, it was the state of California. Um, and so, so there's economic security that could be uh, achieved through buying in through this concentration of coercive force within the military. Um, and then aspects that are, are necessary are, are these concepts of, of territorial limits, 
um, and and then geopolitical and um, diplomatic relationships. So when you look at the, the political system, how do we maintain ourselves within our territory? What are the structural elements of our bureaucracy that we need to function, to collect taxes, to build roads, to do all the things that the state has a responsibility to you as individuals in, that you buy into politically, that you vote for leaders to represent you, to, to make sure that those things are done appropriately and with the values that you want to see expressed by the government. Uh, and then on the international level as well, so in this geopolitical realm that every state now has to deal with these very complex geopolitical relationships and that your representatives again, or maybe if you go directly into it, that, that you could serve in that capacity within the government to work on those relationships. And so you're, you're wrapped up in this political system, which is, is probably one of the most powerful systems that affects your daily life because it's everything from in Russia, I think even your hot water is part of the government system. So your, you know, your hot water that you get in your tap, you know, your roads, um, whether you're quarantined or not, these are all aspects of, of the political life that you are participating in, in one way or another, either by going along with it, by voting with it, by paying your taxes, um, all the different aspects that you do that are tie you into this political network. Questions on Michael Mann? Yeah, can't we say that the econ economic system is kind of getting stronger now than the political system? Um, I think it's a matter of perspective from, from what you're looking at and what specific things you're looking at. All of these things, um, you know, can really matter on, on the position you're in and that you're looking at. Uh, certainly, when we look at the news and, and, the, and we see the movement in the United States to, to end the quarantine, to end the lockdown so people can go back out because they're afraid of the economic system. But you can see that that's also wrapped up into the political system. You find it's also wrapped up into ideology, but it's playing a big part in it. Um, so, and uh, not as, well, there is there's this question of, of militarism as well. If you look at a lot of the protesters in the United States who were going out, they went out carrying as, as many weapons as they could carry. And so they were issuing a challenge to the concentrated ownership of force that the state has um, by, by publicly declaring, look, I have weapons and I am a, a unit of force within the state also. And so they're talking about how that, you know, challenging the monopoly of force that the state has. Um, so, so you see all aspects of the social power can be wrapped up into any one thing. If you're a priest in the United States, then you might see everything in an ideological view. A lot of people are protesting because they want the right to go to church in, in mass, um, in large groups for their evangelical religious purposes. And so they see it as a challenge to their ideology uh, and they're mobilized through their ideology to, to violate the orders or to put pressure on their politicians to, to make exceptions for them. So um, certainly, when we look at the world and we look at the proportion of ability for individuals to influence what's going on in the world, there are clearly economic um, advantages that some people have in that regard. Um, you know, the owner of Amazon, you know, has enough money to become a political force or, you know, the equivalent of a nation in and of himself because of the amount of wealth he's accumulated. So, so yeah, and he can buy a lot of influence, you know, nationally and internationally on the political uh, level. He owns a newspaper, uh, the Washington Post, I think, is under his control. So, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you see the people who, you know, most of the candidates who were running for office in America were, um, you know, you, you had millionaires. You have Donald Trump. You have. Um, uh, Who's the mind blanking? The guy from New York who was running, who dropped out. Um, but uh, but certainly people with power and wealth are able to to buy in and manipulate the, the economic systems to a much greater degree. But I would say that it's it's got a monopoly on the the ability to exert social power 
on people and to adjust their behavior. Um, certainly, it's got a lot of ability to manipulate things, but um, you know, you look at the movement across the Middle East with the fundamentalism and, and uh, uh, ISIS or the Islamic State, um, ostensibly theoretic, uh, theocratically driven, um, theologically driven. Um, you know, what the reality is is, is maybe something different. But there are very rich, powerful people in the Middle East who don't like that, yet these other people are able to use a theological motivation to get people to fight against them. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that that, uh, that there's a, a dominance of economy over the other forms of social power. I think it can be circumstantial. Other question or further? No, go in a different direction. Okay. All right. So again, what we were talking about with Max Weber, going back to what we talked uh, earlier in the week, the state holding that monopoly of legitimate use of violence. Um, and in, in Max Weber's politics of vocation, uh, he says, we wish to understand by politics only the leadership or the influencing of the leadership of a state. The state is a relation of men, dominating men, a relation supported by means of violence. If the state is to exist, the dominated must obey the authority claimed by the powers that be. Um, that was going off a little bit, but what I wanted to, to bring that around to is some of the parameters that Weber sees as necessary to the state. So he sees it as an organization that maintains the monopoly on violence, but it's over a territory. And so I want to lead into this concept of the territoriality associated with complex societies, with states, with empires. So you, the state must have sovereignty, it must have the ability to carry out actions and policies within a territorial boundary, independently from those external forces and actors that might be um, trying to reach in and influence that state. Um, that level of independence now, you know, is something that even then was something that, that could be challenged a lot. Uh, we see it even more now as we have these transnational forces, including social media. So sovereignty requires power, physical or otherwise, to defend against those outside actors. Uh, it requires institutions um, that carry out the state responsibilities. So in, uh, when we talk about those, those layers of state stratification, the, an executive branch, an executive officer, president, uh, the bureaucracy, all those different layers and agencies within the state, uh, military, courts, and so on and so forth through, throughout the, you know, the myriad of agencies that we have in any complex modern state. Uh, but what we want to talk about is that, that territoriality. So, so here's the state, um, and, and territory is, is going to be uh, obviously one of the major measures and identities that a state has. When we, it's, it's about the geography, right, when we talk about political geography. So just looking at some of those ideas of Weber, that you have the institutionalized use of force and, and the sense of legitimacy that, that your government has the right to be your government, that they have a right to rule you. Um, and all that goes into to creating a state. Um, this, again, this emphasis on the use of force, that monopoly, the territory, and the legitimacy of that government. And those all feed into each other creating the identity of a state. So let's look at some different types of states that we might have. You could have strong states or weak states or failed states. Um, there are some suggestions that, that America right now is moving towards a failed state. When you look at our response to the coronavirus, that we are among the worst of the, the industrialized nation states in our response and our ability to contain and to coordinate a national effort on how to deal with it. And so you have different states, the governors of the states have, 
have taken on responsibility and are working on their own without any sort of centralized uh, leadership or guidance to help them to make sure that there's a distribution of the ventilators, of the, uh, the personal protective equipment, these different things where, where there's a, um, a role for the federal government to play in making sure and coordinating the distribution of the resources and the actions of the states to try to contain the spread of the virus and to make sure that the resources are adequate to meet the demands of, of uh, levels of illness, of morbidity, and of mortality. Even what to do with the bodies has become a problem in many areas. I just saw an article today where they found more vans uh, at a mortuary loaded up with decomposing bodies because they, they couldn't handle the flow of, of dead bodies that were coming in or they're using prisoners to dig mass graves in New York. Um, so, so that all these institutions that could benefit from the coordination of a centralized authority and government are, are breaking down. And that's an example of state failure. And so now you're seeing that the bureaucratic mechanisms are not adequate to the stresses that are coming onto the state. When we start talking about the demise of states, that's going to be something to, to consider. Okay. Um, so again, we talked about centralized and decentralized governments. And that, here, I'm not just talking about the authority that we talked about when we talked about service and freed and, and centralized and decentralized authority, but it's related. When you look at the government, um, so if it's centralized that you have, that again, that executive branch holds all the power and that um, everybody is, is directed towards that, that central authority, right? It's the, um, the control freak, right? The, uh, the person, the government that has to know what everybody is doing outside. Or when it's decentralized, where you delegate responsibility to these other people and then they handle the responsibility. So I talk about what's going on in the United States. It's moving from um, what uh, a level of, of, of centralized authority in dealing with the crisis, right? That's usually handled through various agencies that the state has, such as the uh, CDC, uh, you know, the Center for Disease Control, or FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, or um, uh, institutions associated with border control and regulation of, of you know people coming into the country who might be ill. Uh, and instead, we're seeing it break down where governors are, are taking on a lot of these responsibilities on themselves for the states that they govern because they're not getting what they feel are the support from the, the federal level of government. Um, so you're seeing this aspect of decentralization going on. And now you see what's uh, a, a new phenomenon that's been going on for the last few weeks is that states are starting to make alliances and cooperative relationships with each other outside the federal government. So they're figuring out to build networks among themselves. And so what you see is that they're bypassing the center, the, the central authority, and they're going right to each other and drawing direct lines this way in a cooperative relationship to meet the demands of the stress associated with the pandemic. And so you see this breakdown of this centralized uh, authority. And I see we're over time. Huh? All right, so we'll, we'll break it there. Um, next week, we should get into empires more, uh, into some of these territorial ideas. Any questions, thoughts? Uh, yes, actually, I have a question. When we were speaking about ideology, like ide ideological uh, associations and groups, um, remember, right, there were a scheme with like interpersonal, inter, like among small group, and I said, brought an example of ideological community as a religious uh association. Well, I thought uh, whether the SAS with its explicit uh, neoliberal uh, like idea can be counted as ideological. Well, it's not like built upon um, this idea that st like stands behind the SAS, but still uh, this neoliberal, I found it um, pretty explicit and I 
wanted to ask whether it um, can be approached in that way. Yeah, uh, you know, again, some of these things are, are quite subjective. And so, and it might vary from person to person. For you, it might be something very strong ideologically. It was the ideology, you know, the, the, the concept, the ideal of the SES was one of the things that attracted me to come here from Hawaii. Um, that I liked the ideas of education that were being expressed here and the ideas of trying to create more creative ways of thinking, um, which, which ties into an ideology that, that, you know, my personal ideology. So um, I, I think it could be viewed in that way, although it's not structured as such. And so I think such a thing would be a secondary characteristic of it more than the primary characteristic. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? If not, bid you all a good night and I uh, will see you on Monday. And if there's any questions, maybe you have an assignment due tomorrow on the readings, if there's any questions. Oh, I am gonna post uh, an announcement uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning uh, to give you a little more guidance on the um, uh, upcoming assignment. I'm going to change it a little bit from what's in the syllabus, so be prepared for that. Don't be surprised that, that the assignment will look a little different uh, to make it more personalized to, to the areas that you're going to be looking at for the, the different um, societies that you're, you're studying. And then also I'm going to put an emphasis on the use of Zotero for your bibliography. And I'll put a requirement for a number of sources of books and journal articles that I want to see in that, as well as you know, other things can be in there, like websites and things as, as well. Um, but I want to make sure that you are using Zotero and that for each of your groups, that you have a shared Zotero um, folder on the, on the web for the Zotero uh, website, and that you are, are sharing your bibliographic references as you work within your group. Um, so, for some of you, it may be new, you, you don't have that, but uh, in talking with the other faculty, uh, we had a meeting with the anthropology and sociology majors, and then I've been talking with uh, Erica as well, that I, I think it's time that we, we start making this as a standard requirement. It'll make your life so much easier if you go on into academic work. Uh, it'll save you hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of reference management time. Uh, you'll be so amazed at how easy it is if you haven't been using it. And so if you have trouble with it, I think uh, our next uh, session on Wednesday, where we have seminar and group work, that uh, I'll spend maybe 10 minutes and I'll also post some tutorials um, that are on YouTube that are excellent and, and we'll walk you through all the steps for downloading and, and, and starting to use this, this um, reference management system. So just so you're not surprised that there will be some announcements, be aware, watch your Canvas notifications in the, uh, today and tomorrow. All right. Thank you all and good night to you all. We'll see you soon. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks. Thanks.